turn in Luke, uh, Luke to chapter 6. This is uh, the Lord of the Law. This is part 2. Luke chapter 6. And we're going to look at uh, another healing that happened on the Sabbath. There were two of them that are recorded in a row. We believe that this happened back to back, and that's why they put them this way. Uh, Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 6. Now it happened on another Sabbath also that Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. Scribes and Pharisees watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath, that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man who had the withered hand, Arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. And Jesus said to them, I'll ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And when he had looked around at them all, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what might they do to Jesus. Let's pray. Uh, Father, uh, I thank you for a passage where we get to see the true character of your son and uh, we also get to see how we might treat the law. Lord, I ask that you help me to faithfully preach this text and that those with ears to hear would hear. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our congregational verse is Luke 9, 56. And again, I'm going to tell you a couple of times, you'll get this in Textus Recipitus. You'll get it in the line of King James, uh, New King James, but it will be in parentheses, and in some translations with majority of text will not be there. NIV, uh, so you can look at that on your own. In Luke 9, 56, it says, For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Say that with me. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. I am greatly, greatly enjoying our walk through the Gospel of Luke. He covers so many subjects that, quite frankly, I wouldn't even be able to come up with if I tried to do it on my own. So far, we've covered things such as repentance and what that really looks like. We've covered patience and submission. We've covered the divine call of God and the lives of his people. We've covered temptation. And as we look at the book as a whole, he tells us right at the beginning that the book was meant to be a confirmation to the person that was reading it, to Theophilus. He gives us right in the first couple of verses that that was the intention. But as you go through it, you get to see the character of Christ. I mean, really, when we're studying scripture... I'm not standing in the pulpit so that you go away and learn a bunch of right and wrongs. Okay, When you were born, you had a conscience. I'm up here mainly, mainly to teach you who God is through Jesus Christ. You need to understand the character of Christ. I believe the reason that a lot of people are never converted, the reason that a lot of people do not come to Christ is because they do not understand the holiness of God. They don't understand the attributes of who He actually was. You get to know who God is, you develop a fear, and in that fear, eventually it leads to salvation. The last time we left, uh, Jesus was dealing with the Pharisees on the Sabbath. You remember the interaction or the exchange that he had with the religious leaders. Now, Jesus continues to stir the pot. If things are getting worse and worse, as you travel through the book of Luke, you're going to see people getting more and more heated. There will come a point where Jesus will no longer be in the synagogue. Okay, It got too tough for him to be in there. There were too many attacks coming his way, so he starts going hillside, plus the crowds fed into that as well. Now, Jesus was still in the process of teaching in synagogues, and there was a certain Sabbath where he and his disciples were walking through the grain fields and they were hungry. So they were picking off the heads of grain and rubbing them in their hands. And the Pharisees, uh, Pharisees as well as the Sadducees, any religious leaders during that day, came out the scene. 
They saw all that stuff going on. It's interesting because they would have only been able to travel so long, so far according to their own law that they were waiting and watching as he walked through that grain field. Well, they get on the other side and they start to blame Jesus. They get upset with him because in their minds, what the disciples were doing by pulling that head of grain, by rubbing it in their hands was work. And work was not supposed to be done on the Sabbath. Now, there were laws that made it so their disciples could go and do this very thing, but the additions that they had made to God's law, the prescriptions that they wrote for mankind during that time, are really what they were holding the people to. And because they were holding the people to their prescriptions, they were saying, you're breaking our law, and they weren't necessarily breaking God's. Now, Jesus as always, has a witty retort. And he comes back, he said, do you remember the story of David? Do you remember when David and his men were fleeing from Saul and he went to see Ahimelech? Now he comes in front of Ahimelech, which was a priest, a high priest during that time, and he's looking for something to eat. And the only thing available during that time is the showbread. It was a showbread that was put out to represent the 12 tri tribes of Israel. So it's sitting out for the people to come and get, or for the priests to get after a week has turned over. But it was only meant for them. And David said, don't you have something to eat? And Ahimelech's like, the only thing I've got to eat is this bread right here. Now normally it's meant for the priests after a week is over with, we consume this. But if your men have abstained from women, then they can have it as well. David said, we have. So Ahimelech gave him that food to eat. You see, Jesus understood something. And this is the reason that he conveyed that passage to the Pharisees. What he understood is that man himself was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. He says this, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 7, this is a parallel of that same passage. At the end of this debate that he had with the Pharisees, with the religious leaders, he said, But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. Which is really what they were doing. They were using their law as a means to be able to hurt the people around, to restrict them. Although I, thought that, I think that they thought they were being helpful. Jesus ended that debate by telling them that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, which seems insignificant because we see that kind of stuff throughout Scripture a lot. We'll see Lord, uh, we'll see uh, Son of Man, Son of God, so much so that it's neglected in our mind. But what he was telling them is that he was the person that was talked about in the book of Daniel. The first time this title was given to Jesus, it stated him, it, it put him into a position as sovereign over the entire universe. And it was talking about the Messiah to come. So when Jesus said, I am the Son of Man, what their minds immediately would have done is gone back to the book of Daniel and said, wait a second, he's telling us he's ruling all and everything around us? That's exactly what Jesus was saying. Jesus is in charge right now of the expansion of the universe that's currently happening. Scripture even talks about that. Now, if he's in charge of that, don't you think he can handle the Sabbath day? Jesus rules the law. That was the first point we made in this trip through the Scriptures. Chuck Swindoll used to tell a story that I want to relay to you today. He had a good friend that was a youth minister in his church, and their families became very close. I don't know if you've ever listened to Chuck Swindoll. He's a mighty teacher, uh, gives some great insight. I, I, I think I heard Swindoll from the cradle up, uh, so he's embedded in a lot of my thinking, the way that I teach today. But Swindoll was saying that he and the family had gotten really close, and the youth minister himself was a forward-thinking guy. He always was on the cutting edge of youth ministry, always was trying to teach them in a new and different way so that they'd get things. He said that the guy had moved away and went to another church, and he decided that one night he was going to show the youth group there a religious film. Now, this is with the projector. 
talking black and white. He's thinking, I'm doing the most safe thing in the world because I'm going to show them a black and white projector film movie about missionaries. So he shows the kids the movie. The whole thing ends, and uh, about an hour later, there's a big group of church folk that have to talk to him. True story. They pull the guy into the office, and they say, Sir, what have you done? He said, Well, I showed the kids a, a, I showed them a movie about missionaries. He said, Well, we don't do that here. And he wasn't trying to be argumentative, but he came back to them and said, Well, didn't you last month just show some slides that dealt with missionaries here at the church? And a guy starts furiously waving his hand from the group. He's got anger all over his face. He's trying to wave him down. And he said, Sir, sir, what do you need? He said, You need to understand something. If it's still, it's fine. If it moves, it's sin. This is nothing more than legalism. Legalism will tear down a church, will tear down God's people quicker than anything else that we can do. The rules of the legalist are impossible to follow. I want you to think about this. On a given day, are you even able to keep the ten? The Ten Commandments? Are you able to make it through an entire day? If, if that were the backdrop of what you needed to do, are you able to accomplish that? No. Later on, uh, Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is, and we've, we've all heard that, but I think a modern-day summary does it justice in this context. Not in all. But a modern-day summary of what the greatest commandment is, is to love God and to love people. And this is what we're supposed to be doing. And we can't even get that right. Amen, church? You've heard it said before that we need to shoot for the stars and we might hit the moon. I, I, I think that kind of plays out for Christians in our life here. We need to shoot for the stars. We need to do the best that we can to love the people around them, love the people around us, to love God with all that we've got. But sometimes we can't do that. Sometimes we can't arrive at that place. Coming up with a bunch of other rules, a bunch of other regulations will only drag people down, especially when we start to treat those rules and regulations as if they are scripture themselves. We need to watch the comments that we make, especially among our brothers and sisters in Christ, and make sure that we can qualify it biblically. And if you're with me, you need to say amen. The point of this passage today is to show you that God doesn't need our help to establish his law. This morning I have one remaining point in the series, which is Jesus honors the law. Jesus honors the law. Jesus didn't back off, but continued to teach the gospel, even in growing opposition. In verses 6 and 7 it says, It happened on another Sabbath that he entered the synagogue and taught, and a man... Uh, was there whose right hand was withered. So the scribes watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath, that they might find an accusation against him. Jesus didn't stop because he'd been attacked on a previous Sabbath. He kept going. It says in the scriptures that there was another Sabbath. So the last one had just come, and now there was another one. You know, if it was us, if you had been attacked like he had, if you had been met by a big group of people that were coming out after you, I think the next, next Sabbath, you know, if we were still in that regulatory law there, but in the next Sabbath, if we had showed up there, we, we might have been thinking, I'm going to hang back. I'm not really going to get in their face. I'm not going to teach. Even if you were a teacher at that time, I'm going to hang back and I'm going to see what's going on, kind of feel things out. Maybe the fire has died down just a little bit. Jesus didn't. He went back the very next week, and he's going to do the same thing. He's going to teach. It hasn't slowed him down whatsoever. You know, I, 
I would be a little bit fearful if I were in his position. Now, I hope you don't leave this church and you walk out and say, well, I'm scared that the pastor is going to say something to me or possibly that one of the deacons is going to walk up and they're going to regulate the way that I do things so you're afraid to come back. That, that wouldn't be a good thing. But, folks, Jesus had reason to be afraid during this time. These guys were ruthless. They were looking for any way that they could to undermine what he was doing. Ultimately, that led to them killing him. He had reason to be upset with what they were trying to do. Have you ever been attacked for doing something that God has asked you to do? As soon as it happens, most people want to shut down. They want to walk away. Most of us end up asking ourselves, why would somebody like this even attack me when I'm trying to help them? Have you been in a ministry position where somebody has been attacking you? And, and, and I want to qualify again. Remember that our ministry positions are not limited to these four walls. You might have a ministry position that's outside of this where you talk to people about the Lord. But if you had it where people were attacking you for the very things that you were trying to help people with, it's hard to do. The only way I can explain this, and I've given this analogy before, is you need to treat ministry like you're tending to a wounded animal. I don't know if you've ever done this with a dog before or a cat. Nobody should ever do that. But if you've ever done this kind of ministry where some is wounded and you go to help them, if it's a wounded animal, you can see that they need help. They know that they need help. But when you go to approach them a lot of times and bandage the wound or put salve on it, anything that you're going to do, a lot of times you get attacked in the midst of it. Do they need help? Yes, they do. But you'll get attacked in the middle of it. You've got to remember that in ministry. Because if you're doing anything for the Lord, sometimes the very people that need help are going to be the ones that are going to try to cut your throat. That's what was happening. Jesus went out and he ministered. He taught on another Sabbath. What would it take for somebody to go out and do something like that? Sometimes we just want to walk away and we want to say, well, if they don't want me, I'll go and do it somewhere else. It's not what Jesus did and it's not what we should do. Luke notices something that neither of the other gospel writers did. He tells us that the man's right hand was withered. Ever the doctor, those type of details are throughout this book. The withered hand is the result of what happened earlier in his life, or at least... It had to be something that had happened before this day. A lot of times when I've heard this passage preached in the past, I immediately conjure up this image of him being born with some sort of deformity. You know, he had been born that way. He had the withered hand. Or I would think maybe he was getting up there in life a little bit and he had a stroke. It could, it could happen in utero. I don't know. But he had had some sort of a stroke and his hand had withered. But I'll tell you something interesting that I found when I did the Greek here. The Greek here, when it talks about that hand, it talks about a hand that was withered in the sense that it was scorched. That it was burned. Has anybody ever thought about it like that? I haven't. It's almost like a leaf that you walk up to and you pull off of a tree and it's green and it's nice. In a couple days you come back, it shriveled up. That's what his hand would have looked like. We don't know exactly what happened, but we know that he is in a position where he can't work. Well, folks, if you're in this society and you can't work, you're in a bad place. You need to be able to work to provide for his family. So maybe he's walking around one day trying to find help or work. He's saying, I'll volunteer, I'll do anything. And they look at him and they look, buddy, you've only got one hand. He said, I'll do what I can with one hand. That's the plot of this guy's life. That's the way that he was living. After what Jesus had done on the previous Sabbath, there's no way that the religious leaders were going to let that go. There's no way that they weren't going to follow up with him. Our text says that they watched him closely to see if he would heal anyone so they could accuse him. Again, this is why I love preaching through books. Are you watching somebody closely? 
Are you like these religious leaders that are waiting to hurl an accusation at somebody around you? You're waiting for them to get tripped up because you want to bring them down. Is that you? Am I speaking to you in this room? Because if that's you, then you're playing the very part that the Sadducees, that the Pharisees, that even to the point the disciples of John did for a little while. You're looking to bring people down. You're looking to nitpick a ministry so that you can say, Ha! They did it. Eventually every one of us is going to get tripped up and do something that we shouldn't. They believe that healing somebody on the Sabbath was a sinful thing to do. From an observational standpoint, I can see at least two reasons why the people do this. First, they feel threatened. Why would the Pharisees, religious leaders, why, why would they have been looking to take Jesus out? Well, they felt threatened. You had a man show up that not only shows up and he's able to teach better than them, but on top of it, when he says a prayer, the person is healed right there in front of them. There are flocks of people coming in. The crowds were getting greater and greater. And if the people end up following Jesus, then they ultimately are saying, by default, that the ministry of the Pharisees was wrong. You think that caused a little bit of fear in your life, if you were them? Yeah, absolutely. And, and if that fear is caused, it, it generally works its way out in fight or flight. They're either going to fight Jesus or they're going to flee it, trying to get away from the whole thing altogether. I'll never forget a girl that in... Uh, Church's past, she had a card ministry where she wrote cards. She loved to write notes to people. Who in here likes to get a handwritten note from people? I, I certainly do. I've had it on uh, birthdays. Uh, I've had it on special occasions or things going on in your life. That's what this woman loved to do. She had all these different cards that she'd send out if it was a birthday or an anniversary or somebody had joined the local fellowship. She would do that kind of thing. Well, eventually, there was a group of women that got together and they had been talking about her and they were upset because she was writing these cards. But not only because she was writing these cards, but because some of their husbands were included with the cards. So they come up to her. And they say, ma'am, could you please stop writing these cards because we think it's inappropriate. Now she was writing to the entirety of the church, kids, youth, adults. It didn't matter what it was. But do you see the legalism in that? The problem is, is a lot of times we can't identify that legalism because we're standing right in the middle of it and we feel right in our own eyes, which leads me to my second point. My second point is, a lot of times, people believe that what they're doing is right. The Pharisees attacked these men, not because most likely they had an ulterior motive, but because they thought that what they were doing was right. This is what they had been taught from generations before. So they were just going to follow it up. They were going to continue in the same path, because if Daddy did it, then I'm going to do the same thing. But they couldn't point back to the law to see where it was right. Folks, we've done a lot of things here in the United States among our churches that isn't right. Segregation was not right. Some people will point back to the Word of God. And you know what they'll say? They'll say, well, the Word of God talks about slavery. What Jesus did is taught the slaves how to act and react in the situations that they were in. That did not make it right. He taught them how to be godly people among those that were lording over them, over them a law that never should have been established. But we accepted it for a long time as a church, didn't we, church? We, we had separated out, and, and we can't just put it on us because the black congregations in Baptist history did the very same thing. They said, we need our own congregation, and they went their own way. But was that right? No would be the answer here. absolutely wrong but we lifted this stuff up as if it was gospel truth and it's not how about this one I know I'm touching a sore one but it's so fun have you ever I, I, I was privileged to hear some great 
preachers growing up. But I also heard some idiots. And there were times where I heard men say from the pulpit that if you smoke a cigarette, you're going to hell. Had anybody ever heard that? And anybody, I, I, there's probably a lot of people in here that may have heard that same message. If you smoke a cigarette, you're going to hell. Now, I'm not approving of smoking cigarettes. It's dumb. I'm going to say the biblical word. It is stupid to do that. Why would you do that to your body? You might end up smelling like hell by the time you're done, but you're certainly not going to go there. <laughs> Folks, this is how they were attacking the people of that day. The scribes and the Pharisees found themselves in a position where they were enforcing their laws on people that were not given out by God himself. They had good intentions, I believe, at some point, but they had strayed so far from what God would have had them do. You must keep in mind the fact that Jesus would not have done anything to bring dishonor to his father. He was perfect in his representation of him. Jesus honored the Father in everything he did. Jesus fulfilled the law where no one else could. Jesus honored the law even when the accusations were coming his way. It had to be extremely tough to be around Jesus at times. We like to hide behind our respective masks far too often. In verses 8 and 9 it says, But Jesus knew their thoughts. And said to the man who had the withered hand, Arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. Then Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or destroy it? Jesus was operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. Church, get this piece with me. If you've tracked through Luke, you've seen what's happened. Jesus is showing up in his humanity here. And as he's in his humanity, the one thing that he wants to do is show you that a life can be lived that's holy and righteous. Okay, but, but he wasn't supernaturally taking on the things of God because Philippians chapter 2 tells us clearly that he emptied himself of that. So how did Jesus know the thoughts of these men? We know that he was filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit was revealing to him the thoughts of these men. That's what was going on. He had a sense of the situation before he even walks in because the Holy Spirit's out in front leading him into every nook and cranny of life that he would go into. And he does the same for us today. Have you ever had a sense about something as a believer that you were walking into? You didn't stop going into it, but you went into it knowing that the Lord was with you? Jesus had that all the time. And beyond that, do you think that these guys were irritated with him? How, how well do you hide it when you're mad? Do you do a good job of that? When you get really angry, are you able to just pack that up and put on a smile and walk out with it? Well, God bless you if you are, because I can't do it. I can't do it. And I think Jesus walked into there, he looked at the glares on their faces. He knew exactly what they were thinking. I did what they didn't like on the last Sabbath, now they're mad with me. Jesus' question cut to the core issue that we need to get to here. He was calling them out for wanting, uh, for wanting things that they shouldn't. He wanted to know if it was alright to do good or evil on the Sabbath, to save life or destroy it. There was one twofold requirement on the Sabbath. Again, church, this is a big point here. There was one twofold requirement on the Sabbath. What God had told them to do on Mount Sinai, there was one thing that they needed to do. They needed to cease work and honor Him. Cease work and honor Him. This is what they were expected to do. It didn't mean that they had to cease the way that they peeled a banana or the way that they walked down the street. It just meant that their everyday work was supposed to stop and that was it. And they were supposed to honor Him during that day. I don't know if they could have got behind Donald's the dolphins and skied, you know, on the Red Sea. I, I don't know if that would have been okay in their eyes or not, but it would have been okay as far as what Jesus commanded on Mount Sinai to Moses. These people kept pushing things that did, did not need to be done. He knew if they said it was lawful to do good, then all he had to do was turn around, grab the guy's hand, and heal it. 
Although if they said it was unlawful, then that would expose the wretchedness of their hearts. That's why he asked them that question. Unfortunately, this is a scenario that we run into far too often when we're seeking to serve God. Now, while I believe that training the hearts is the best measure to defend ourselves before the world, I also acknowledge that memorizing tactics is a good thing to do as well. Let me explain this real quick and we'll move through this section. We're supposed to hide the Word of God in our heart so that we might not sin against God. You're supposed to be doing that. That's, that's your deal. That's between you and God. There, there comes a point where procedure can be memorized as well, and it's not something we automatically do. Here's what I think happens when the Word of God gets embedded in your heart. It comes to a point where it is a knee-jerk reaction where you get into a situation and God has so prepared you that he's the one, he tells us that he does this in scripture, that he's going to bring it into your mind as the thing that you need to do. But sometimes I believe that there are tactics that need to be memorized and they're not going to be as knee-jerk as something like that. And if we learn to say to our skeptics exactly what he said to the Pharisees, to the religious leaders in that day, it would be an awesome thing to do. Do you think I came here to do good or to do evil? To save life or destroy it? Wouldn't that be a great question to ask your critics? You know, as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, if I ask that question, do you think I should do good or do evil, to save life or destroy it? There could be a person that says, well, I think you came here to do evil. That would be the danger in that question. But do you know what the next response needs to be? How? How? You know in your heart of hearts what your intention was for any ministry that you do. And I hope that you have a ministry that you're doing. But folks, if somebody comes your way trying to slam the very thing that God has asked you to do, you ask them that question, do you think I intended to do good or to do evil, to save life or destroy it? And if they say, I think you came to do evil, then you say, how? And in that question, you reveal the intention of their heart. Which is why Jesus asked them this in the first place. Your ministry might be to make jewelry. Your ministry might be to cook or to sing. Your ministry might be to make clay pots. I don't care what your ministry is. You could be tending to the sick. Whatever your ministry is, if you're doing it for the Lord, I guarantee you, if you're doing it for the Lord, it will be attacked. And you need to be prepared. In the next couple of months... I'm going to just qualify here. In the next couple of months, surgery willing, we're going to do a ministry here called Overflow Ministries. Overflow Ministries is going to happen in our medians. You know, a little travel way that's in between you up here on Memorial. We're going to walk out as a church and we're going to hand out hot chocolate or lemonade in places that legally allow us to do this. I have talked to our city manager already. But folks, this is a ministry that we can get involved with, and I think that this would be a great thing to do to get the word out about First Baptist Church. I continue to tell you, a lot of people love to come to church here. We hear that all the time. They say it's a great fellowship. People will come through those doors right there, and they say, I was so loved when I came through the doors. But nine times out of ten when I'm in this community, and I talk about First Baptist Church, the first question I hear is what? Where is it? So we've got to have this place exposed a little bit better. I assume that somebody is going to come to me and they're going to say, why are you doing that? I don't think that's a good idea. And I hope that God gives me the ability to answer them in that time. Do you think I intended to do good or do evil, to destroy life or to save it? And let me throw this out, the Holy Spirit, give me this. Let me throw this out to you. If you're in this room right now and you'd like to be over-organizing that, I need your help. Well, if God's speaking to you, don't be Jonah because you'll get swallowed by a big fish. <laughs> the point is, their heart is going to be exposed. Jesus honors 
ever let somebody tell you that we're in this grace, we are in a grace period, but we're in this grace period where the morality, the moral law that was given in the Ten Commandments no longer needs to be followed. That's not true. That's not true. If you love the Lord, you're able to follow it. If you prescribe for somebody to do that that doesn't know Jesus, it's an impossibility. They just can't do it. Love God, love people. Ain't that right, Miss Lou? She played a song for us that talked about that. Proverbs 11.23, The desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. Okay, if you have checked out, you need to check in, because this is my favorite part of this entire passage. Verses 10 and 11. Look at what Jesus did. And when he had looked around at all of them, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Okay, let's set this up because this is too good. And I just read it and I think 90% of us still missed it. But this is why this is so good. So Jesus goes another Sabbath back and his disciples are being attacked by the religious leaders for doing what they did. Okay? And in the next week, they're looking for opportunity to do the very same thing. They come in. So he comes in filled with the Holy Spirit doing the ministry. Jesus is as he normally does. And he looks out and there's a man who has a withered hand. Scorched possibly. But um, a man who has a withered hand in front of them. We don't know if this guy was a plan or not. We don't know if the religious leaders said, let's just throw this guy in here. See if he'll heal him because that's going to be sinful. It'll be great. We don't, we don't know if that's what happened or not. But Jesus walks in. He sees the guy with the withered hand. And it says in the passage of Scripture that he asked the guy to stand up. So the guy stands up and he pulls the man up in front of the entire congregation that was around. So everybody's watching the guy with the withered hand. The Pharisees are just waiting. We've baited him. We've got him right where we want him. And then Jesus asked the question. Is it right for me to do good or to do evil? To destroy life or to save it? Now here, here's the part that I love the most. This is exactly what it says. And it's intensified in the Greek. So the guy's standing there with a withered hand in front of them. Jesus asked the question and he does this right here. That's what just happened. I mean, this is not something I'm speculating on could have happened. That's what just happened. The guy is just standing there with a withered hand. And Jesus takes the time in total silence where you can hear a pin drop to stop and look at every person in the room. He's just scanning them. He's asked the question, where's the response? Nobody's given a response. Basically, Jesus is saying this without saying this. I asked the question, what are you going to say? What are you going to say? Nothing? <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> that is the best part of this passage, in my opinion. He just stared them down. He doesn't have, he might have his 12, but remember, there were millions of people. There were Pharisees that have come out of every land. There could have been hundreds of them around. He just stood up in the middle of them, asked the question, and looked them in the eye. Boy, what you going to do? Man, the courage of our Savior is so amazing in Scripture. After this scene took place, no one walked away and said, Jesus is lucky that he didn't give me an opportunity to say something. Because he did. They just didn't have anything to say. Many years ago, I learned an unsettling fact. And, and I hope that you write this down for your own ministries, whatever they are. I learned an unsettling fact about people. When they get angry with you, you need to give them every opportunity to respond. If somebody doesn't like what you're doing, if you allow them to come in and talk with you, it's not that you're going to agree with them. 
So don't walk away saying, the pastor's saying I should just change my mind. And It's not what I'm saying. Let them come up to you because they have been building and building and building and they need to get it out of their system. Do you know what happens if they don't talk to you about it? Who are they going to talk to? Other people, and chances are they've already been doing that and they're going to continue to do that anyways. So the best thing that you can do is you can bring them in, say, what is the problem? I'm willing, I'm listening. You don't have to agree with it, but folks, let me tell you something. If you don't unclog that sewer, it's going to back up into your bathroom. At the end of the day, Jesus did what was right, and the man's hand was made whole. Jesus won, but it wasn't over. Verse 11 says, They were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Just because you had that hard conversation with somebody doesn't mean that you've won the war. You might have won the battle, but you didn't win the war. Pride destroys people. It brings them down. And Jesus knew that. Because he knew the cross was coming his way. You want a great quote? Great quote. This is a quote that I was given many years ago from a man, a godly, godly man that went to our church. A man by the name of Paul Taylor. Paul Taylor said this, and he said it time and time again. It was his thing. He said, no man's life can withstand a determined critic. No man's life can withstand a determined critic. I don't want to give you an out, but we are not Jesus. We do our best to emulate him. If somebody wants to pick at a ministry or uh, the life that you're living, guess what? They're going to find some ammunition that's viable. Eventually, they're going to find a grenade that they can throw at you that's true what I have to remember the entire time is that even though that's going to happen God is going to protect me if I'm doing what he called me to do protect me in the sense of I might die protect me in the sense of I might make it through this situation and get fired protect me in the sense that I might lose my marriage or a child but if you're doing what God has asked you to do he's going to be right there with you because in the end the worst thing that can happen is you get to go and be with Jesus The religious leaders knew the word of God inside and out. So when Jesus asked his question, uh, they knew the answer. They didn't have to go to a scroll to find it out. Isaiah wrote about false sacrifices and what that means to the Lord. We're going to end our time by looking at a passage. Think about how pointed this passage is to your life today. How could something have been written that long ago that is so accurate to today? Isaiah 1, 11 through 17. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, God? Says the Lord, I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. And I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you the trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I, look at this, this is God speaking. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become to me a burden and I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. The people of this passage were not rebuked for doing what God asked them to do. But making sacrifices in place of compassion for others. 
That's the main problem Jesus had with the religious leaders. They were willing to sacrifice others for the sake of their religious ideals. Jesus never violated the law by healing the man on the Sabbath. No, on the contrary, he honored it. How many of you are like the priests in the passage I just read from Isaiah? You're making sacrifices to the Lord, but your hands are covered with blood. You say, I haven't haven't killed anyone. My hands aren't covered with blood. Listen to me. Jesus was speaking to a group of people that thought that they were righteous but held their religiosity, the things, the rules that they made up, above the law of God. And in that same passage of scripture I just read, Jesus is basically saying, God's basically saying, if you come to me with these open hands, what I see is blood on your hands. What he's saying is there's no forgiveness there for you. So if you continue in that same track, You're no different than the religious leaders of that day. If you want to be forgiven and saved, a lot of people think they're saved, but they're following this ideal that we never see in the Word of God. It's something that we've made up. What does Jesus require of you? Scripture makes this absolutely clear. If you want to follow Christ, you repent and put your faith and trust in Him. That's what we're supposed to do. If you start repenting today, you have a relationship with Christ. But it's a relationship of repentance that begins here today and goes throughout the rest of your life. So was it a one-time thing? And you're done, you washed your hands of it, and you're just trying to keep the rules. Folks, you don't have to keep the rules. What you need to do is love God and love people if you're a child of His. If you're loving God and loving people and you don't know Him, guess what? You're condemning yourself even further. I want to talk to you if you don't know the Lord. I want to talk to you about what a relationship with Him is like. And if you'd like to talk with me about that, I'll tell you again. But it's going to be some of the same stuff. You've got to start repenting. There's no other gospel message. There's no other call to salvation anywhere in Scripture. You don't see it any other way. If you're reading through Scripture and you see something that you're doing wrong, but you're not willing to back off of it, then folks, you need to start repenting because I'm guessing that you don't have a relationship with Jesus in the first place. You should be convicted over what you read. You should be convicted over what you do. You say, I don't even know where to go and read and get that stuff. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Read through it yourself. Read through 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Read through 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at it for yourself. If you're continually disqualifying yourself for a relationship with Christ, here's a good list of don'ts. A good list of things that say at the end of it, if you're doing these things, you will not enter the kingdom of God. You say, well, I feel saved. Man, I felt thin a few days ago. Come to the Lord. Bring your convictions. Lay them down at His feet. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, our time in here. I pray that you were honored through the preaching of your word. But Father, as your Holy Spirit moves, I ask that your Spirit would work in the lives of these people in a way that man's voice man's words would never be able to ask that your word would penetrate deep and repentance would begin in the lives of some that may not know you i ask all these things in jesus name amen let's stand